everyone. Welcome to our briefing. This briefing is brought to you by WorldAware and Crisis24, subsidiaries of GardaWorld. Crisis24 and WorldAware are working together towards a single goal, delivering best-in-class intelligence and risk management services to our clients and partners. Our first presenter today is Toomey Wallace. Toomey is a senior intelligence analyst focused on Eastern Europe and Central Asia. He studied political science and history followed by postgraduate law at the University of Cape Town. Toomey has previous experience as a policy analyst in criminal justice for a Texas state senator and as a strategy consultant for the consumer industry and government in Cape Town. Toomey is going to discuss the peace deal and likely repercussions. Toomey? Thank you. On the 10th of November, after 44 days of intense fighting, the leaders of Armenia, Azerbaijan and Russia released a joint statement ending hostilities in Nagorno-Karabakh. While three previous ceasefire deep agreements over the disputed region failed, the joint statement formalizes the military defeat and withdrawal of Armenia-aligned forces from Nagorno-Karabakh. It has since become clear that the peace deal will have significant political ramifications within Armenia. Protests erupted in Yerevan shortly after the agreement was announced, with protesters denouncing the peace deal and demanding the resignation of Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan. As of the 19th of November, Protests have continued daily in Yerevan and other Armenian cities as protesters continue to call for the resignation of Pashinyan and his administration. It's highly likely that protests will continue over the near term and that Pashinyan's administration will become increasingly unstable. It is doubtful whether Pashinyan's administration can survive. However, any new administration would likely face the same geopolitical constraint as Pashinyan an inability to reverse military losses in Nagorno-Karabakh, hostile diplomatic relations with Azerbaijan and Turkey, and an over-reliance on Russian trade and security, which has been exacerbated by the deployment of Russian peacekeepers in Nagorno-Karabakh. Pashinyan was almost certainly well aware that signing a peace deal with Azerbaijan would place his, his administration under severe, possibly existential pressure but the Prime Minister has repeatedly made his position clear. He signed the tripartite agreement to prevent further territorial and military losses in the face of Azerbaijan's substantial military advances and in an attempt to preserve the future status of Nagorno-Karabakh as an autonomous region within Azerbaijan. Frankly, it's difficult to fault him. His decision to sign the accord was supported by the de facto ethnic Armenian leadership of Nagorno-Karabakh and by Armenia's military, senior military advisors. Further Azeri military advances were highly likely after they recaptured the city of Shusha on the 8th of November. By late evening on the 9th of November, Azeri forces were within two kilometers of Stepanakert, the largest city in Nagorno-Karabakh. Battles were taking place at multiple points along the Larchin Corridor, one of the main supply routes linking Armenia and Stepanakert, practically forcing its closure. Nagorno-Karabakh's de facto leadership has since claimed that if Azeri advances were to continue at that pace, the entire region would have been retaken in a matter of days. While they may be exaggerating to save face, outside observers state the capture of Stepanakert would have quickly resulted in the encirclement of Armenian forces in the Agdam and Kojaven districts. So the ultimate military defeat of Armenia-aligned forces was looming. Azerbaijan's successes on the battlefield enabled the president, Ilham Aliyev, to enter negotiations from a position of strength. He subsequently forced the Armenian prime minister to sign a really tough deal. Reports indicate Pashinyan also came under great pressure from Russian president Vladimir Putin to end the fighting. As a result, the Armenians agreed to a deal that is far more favorable to Azerbaijan than a purely negotiated settlement would have been. If Armenia had accepted a negotiated settlement in 2015, they would have been required to return to Azeri control the seven districts surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh, and Nagorno-Karabakh itself would have remained an autonomous ethnic Armenian enclave within Azerbaijan. Under the recently signed peace deal, which some Armenians are calling the capitulation agreement, the future status of the enclave remains unclear and Armenian forces must withdraw from the three Azeri districts that remain under their control within the next 11 days. 
their forces must withdraw from the Agdam district by the 20th of November and the Lachin district by the 1st of December. They were due to withdraw from the Kalbajar district on the 15th of November, but Azerbaijan agreed to extend that deadline to the 25th of November on humanitarian grounds. It was initially unclear whether the agreement called for the withdrawal of Armenian settlers. However, the Azeri foreign minister has since made it clear that Armenians who settled during the occupation are also expected to vacate each district by the appropriate date. Armenia must also establish a direct road link between Azerbaijan and the ethnic Azeri enclave of Nachivan. Armenia will also be responsible for guaranteeing safe passage along that route. Finally, the ceasefire deal calls for almost 2,000 Russian peacekeepers to be deployed to Nagorno-Karabakh, ostensibly to alleviate tensions and ensure the safety of Armenian civilians. Initially, the peacekeepers will secure the Lachin Corridor and the line of contact between Azeri and ethnic Armenian forces. They will then be deployed in parallel to the withdrawing Armenian forces. On more than one occasion, including during the recent hostilities, Azerbaijan has rebuffed calls for Russian peacekeepers to be deployed in place of ethnic Armenian forces. It now appears that having gained the military and diplomatic edge over Armenia, Azerbaijan is willing to allow Russian peacekeepers in exchange for some big concessions from the Armenians. Signing the accord has sparked a fresh crisis in Armenia. Moments after Pashinyan signed the deal, angry protesters stormed parliament, assaulting the speaker and demanding the prime minister's resignation. A second day of demonstrations on the 11th of November saw tens of thousands of protesters descend on government buildings in Yerevan. Numerous arrests were made, including of opposition party members. Large protests have been reported in the city every day since, with most protesters continuing to call for the prime minister's resignation. A sizable minority is demanding that the fight for Nagorno-Karabakh continue. However, it is extremely unlikely that any new leadership would, in, would attempt to re-engage Aziri forces or retake territory in Nagorno-Karabakh. They would have very little chance of prevailing. Several opposition figures have accepted this. They've called the protests necessary expressions of grief and frustration and insist that martial law be cancelled so people can protest without fear of arrest. And nearly all opposition figures, as well as the state president, are unified in their demand for Pashinian's resignation and fresh elections. The ruling coalition, however, continues to insist that stability is essential in the wake of Armenia's defeat. They have resisted calls for an emergency session of parliament, which would likely see the prime minister face a vote of no confidence, and attempted to shift the narrative to the resettling of Armenians displaced from Nagorno-Karabakh. This could be a risky tactic, as the ongoing withdrawal of Armenian residents is highly emotive. The withdrawal deadlines could easily be flashpoints for major protests. Despite calls for stability, Pashinyan's administration has also been shaken by the lack of success on the battlefield and the resultant unfavorable conditions of the agreement. The foreign minister resigned on the 16th of November following a public spat with the prime minister. The deputy foreign minister was fired straight afterwards. Pashinyan also fired the national commander of the police force in the wake of these anti-government protests. Several members of parliament from the ruling faction have resigned and parliamentary activity is constantly disrupted by walkouts and fiery speeches denouncing the administration. However, the collapse of Pashinyan's administration is far from certain. The prime minister was until recently very popular. He came into power on a wave of positivity through legitimate elections following the revolution in 2018. He likely still derives much authority from winning those elections, which were widely declared free and fair, a rarity in Armenia. Nonetheless, political instability and pressure on Pashinian to resign are expected to persist through the end of the year. Unauthorized, unannounced protests will likely continue to take place in Yerevan and urban centers nationwide over the immediate term before likely dying down as winter sets in. As mentioned before, the withdrawal dates, the 20th and 25th of November and the 1st of December, will likely be flashpoints for larger protests. Events in Nagorno-Karabakh in general will also play out in some way in Yerevan. 
spikes in tension between Azeri forces and Armenian residents could result in impromptu protests outside parliament, especially if those tensions become violent. The ongoing protests, as well as martial law and related security force deployments, will likely continue causing travel and business disruptions in Yerevan and other urban centers. Authorities may also choose to increase security ahead of key dates in order to prevent significant unrest. Armenia's government is in a precarious position and we will continue to monitor the situation closely. As developments in Nagorno-Karabakh play out in Armenia, we will continually assess how our clients may be impacted.